Okay, hello and welcome to the Pixlr Editor webinar where we're going to cover uh, all kinds of things on how to uh, use this editor which is a very Photoshop-like uh, editing tool and yet it's free online. Um, you can create new images, you can open images from your computer and do things like resize them, uh, crop them, do all those normal types of things. Uh, but you can go a lot further with it because this has full layering capabilities, uh, text image, on image capabilities where you can move the text layers around. Uh, text appears as a layer, so it's actually uh, movable. Um, you can change its location. Uh, unlike the old Photoshop 4, you can actually edit the text. So it's got a lot of great features. You can also, and I'll be showing a lot about this, you can open an image from a URL, meaning you don't have to actually download an image from the web by saying save image as and get it on your hard drive first. You can simply grab the URL of the image, and I'll show you how to do that, and, uh, and bring it right into Pixlr directly. And if you all got to um, these through this website, you'll see all of these banners and stuff. This is my, uh, my Pixlr uh, templates page. And uh, all of these banners, you simply click on the little link above the banner and it automatically loads in the banner to uh, an instance of Pixlr. There we go. With the size already correct. Oh, in fact, as a matter of fact, let me um, just bring up Zoom, and I forgot to bring my Zoom it program in. There we go. But as you can see, this is already 300 by 250, and uh, it automatically loaded from a URL, which is this URL up here, um, and it loaded right in as a template that you can then edit, add layers to, add in the layers. Each layer can have separate images on it. I'll be showing you how to add those separate images, how to mask them, how to uh, how to cut the information uh, out similar to erasing uh, so that you can see through a top layer image to what's behind it. So say you wanted to get rid of some of the background of one image to show a different color, different kind of sky image for instance in the back. Uh, you can do that very easily using this program. Um, another thing you can do is open image from libraries. You can uh, use this program to open from many different libraries. Let me cancel out for a sec. You can use uh, its own build. They have an image library in the cloud where you can save your images uh, that they host themselves. That's free hosting. Or you can use Facebook library, uh, the uh, Flickr, you can connect with Flickr, you can connect with your Picasso library and your Inuo uh, libraries as well. So that's a bunch of cloud access that you've got right from this tool. Okay. So the big Im deal though of course is where do, I, where do you get images to begin with and so uh, I thought since people are just starting out and um, may not have a huge image library and you're going to need some images to do things, let's open up one of these templates over here and uh, let's get rid of that. Let's say we make, well, I made a banner like this last week. We'll do a leaderboard again. It's sort of large size. That's why I can get rid of that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go get us an image that we can put into this leaderboard thing to make a 728 by 90 standard leaderboard. Well, this is a standard AdWords um, ad size, by the way. In case you're new to all of this, uh, this page, you know, I'm going to paste this link into the into the uh, section there. Whoa! Let me just get this out of here. Okay. There's this link to my page is now in the uh, chat section, so you can uh, grab that and take a look at it. But all of these are uh, up top. These are Google AdWords image ad formats. These are right from their own website, and they give the uh, 
the basic dimensions that they want to see for Google AdWords ads if you're going to use the display network. And uh, so when I found out about this Pixlr being able to make the clickable links that would automatically open, I said, oh my gosh, what a great use for this thing, and I created this little page. Uh, I, they also had the mobile image ads that they use for the display network, and that's what these different sizes are. Um, you have, these are for iPhones and other mobile devices with full HTML browsers, as it says. And then you have these compliancy sizes, and even the Japan standard. So the way I've got it set up is you just click on the link and it opens up the template in Pixlr. I also put some WordPress things, like there's your standard WordPress banner, you know, when you start a new install of WordPress and the, uh, they have that banner with that nice picture in it um, of the, uh, con the country scene there. Well, this is the size 940 by, by uh, 198. And since I used WP Local Pro from uh, Jason Flatley, and I've got the standard images that work in there too. And I'll be adding more. If you ever want some added to this page, just email me at tbritton at gmail.com and, uh, and ask for some sizes to be added to this. And I'll go ahead and throw some in. This can get uh, as large as we want to make it. Okay? But once you do load a template in, as I was saying, you then just have nothing but blank empty space and you've got to get something in it. So that's the next issue is how do I get my blank empty space filled with actual image content? And there are several different places you can go for images, but I'm going to show you one great tip right off the bean that uses some features that Google uh, will give you. Okay? And uh, so, of course, you can just say free images and, uh, and see what they show you. And we get a bunch of different things showing up here, including uh, Stock Exchange, the f leading free stock photography site. Okay, this is a great resource, and I'll put its URL in the uh, chat box there for you right now. There it is. They have a ton of free images that they let people use, and their um, policy, their usage policy, is very, very free and open, and you can use this stuff for commercial use. This is a arm of Getty Images, and I think what they're trying to do, the reason Getty Images got into this, uh, is that Getty Images is now the largest stock house of them all that sells images. And when you're actually ready to start using professional images, they're there, of course, right there, ready to sell them to you. And um, and the nice thing about pro images is that, I mean, let's face it, they go through a jury process, and they really are pretty nice darn images. And uh, so when you move up to that point of using better images, fine. Then you'll be ready because you had these free images to practice with, okay? Um, this is a pretty cool image. Uh, but there's other sources. Now, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open another Google tab over here. There we go. Oh, I noticed that you can't get to the advanced search from the new uh, Google window anymore. How do you like that? Anybody ever notice that? i never seen that before. You actually have to start typing something in there to get advan to advanced search. That's a brand new little change they just added. Um, I wanted to show you advanced search because this is a great way to find other images. And so, as you just saw, and this is, like I said, a brand new trick that they just pulled on us. You get to advanced search to the right of the Google search. It's not on the main Google page until you start typing something in it, then it changes to this thing. This might be because I got that automatic... Um, search thing going on. But anyway, advanced search, use what the ones you want to use. And let's say we want to find um, images of uh, flowers. Okay. And we want them to be free. We need some free flowers because we're not ready to you know, buy anything. We're just getting used to this, using banners and whatnot on websites, and uh, we haven't made a huge turnover yet. 
Well, here's the secret place that you want to look at. It's right here at the bottom where it says date, usage rights, region, and more. Okay? And you click on that, and it opens up a place where you have usage rights. See that? And right now it's not filtered by any license. Well, we do want it filtered by license. We want to search filtered to this. Free to use, share, or modify, even commercially. This allows us to use it even in a commercial website uh, to share or modify it, meaning we can add text to the top of it, and alter it, um, cut it up, use portions of it, stuff like that, and use it even commercially. So that's, that's the important um, differentiation that we need to say. Now, anything that Google shows us that are flowers when we do our search will have been marked as public domain or at least free to use. Uh, there used to be everything was uh, public domain uh, that you would use, but now they have the new Creative Commons licenses that are different ways that people can label their copyright levels and and tell people what kind of rights, what kind of usage rights they've got. Okay? So, uh, here we go. Cool. Um, now here we have tons and tons of flowers. I don't know why. It, always, it thinks I'm in San Francisco for some reason. I must have moved recently. But obviously, Wikipedia is going to have a bunch of images. Now, Wikipedia is interesting because they have a lot of images, and they are mostly all in the public domain, free to use, or, or free to use. They also have the um, some that have, uh, well, you have, to, you have to look. See, this is freely licensed, and you have to read what free content means on their website, you see. And this stuff is free to use, modify the content, uh, distribute works, derive from the content. And this is uh, completely open, okay, a completely open license. Whenever you get to an image at Wikipedia, you will see down here at the bottom, you will see what kind of usage rights you've got. You should always take a look and see which kind of usage rights are being released. But here's a whole bunch of flowers, and of course I just was using the flowers thing as a uh, as an example. Uh, here's more images for flowers, and uh, so all of these could possibly be stretched out or, or use a portion uh, thereof. Yeah, it looks like it could be used a portion, uh, and as you see now, it's taken me to this page that the actual image exists on is at freephoto.com but they've watermarked it. Well that doesn't necessarily bother us um, and look they crunched it. It's actually not even placed in their page correctly. That's pathetic. Well, oh righty. So we do see what people tend to do. If we did go to this thing though and um, right clicked on it you'll see that there's a copy image location. Oops, let me, let me just, uh, I have to bring that up. There we go. See copy image location right there? That gets the URL of this image. And I can go back to my photo editor and I can hit here, at file, open image URL. Do you see that? Open image URL. Click on that and paste this that I just got right in there, and it opens that image up in Pixlr. So now I have two things open. Okay? Did you all catch that? How cool that was. It just opened two images side by side. Now this is a little bit skinny for our uses, but uh, heck, I can change. I can fix that. Well, why this is fantastic is that I can do a select all by going up to the edit menu and say select all which is, of course is control A and they show you all, notice they show you on the right hand side of the menu they show you what the shortcut keys are for all these standard keyboard shortcuts uh, for these basic editing functions. So I can select all then I can do a copy which is control C as you can see right up here copy control C 
Okay? I don't want to get you all dizzy with too much of that. And then move over to here and paste with Control V. Now I've got this image, and I'm going to pick out. I'm in the Crop tool right now. Let me pick the Move tool. By the way, you notice the Move tool's got a V. So that if you just hit the V, think of the arrow pointing down, paste down, like pasting down. Um, move tool uh, also uses a V, okay, <laughs> for move. Vuh, vuh, vuh. So they try to give you a mnemonics where you'll be able to remember the shortcut keys. In this case, for all of these tools, you don't have to actually hit a um, modifier key. You simply hit the key itself, and it selects the uh, the tool. So I'm just going to hit the V, and you'll notice that it selected that. So now I'm in the Move tool, and that means I can grab this and move it around. Now notice another thing that's happened is that over here in Layers, I have something called Layer 1 now, and that's where my flowers wound up. So I have my original white background layer, and now I've got this Layer 1. I'm going to call the Layer 1 Flowers. What I did is I double-clicked on it, and then you don't hit Enter to make it take. You simply click outside of it and that makes it take. That's kind of a strange anomaly that seems to be uh, something in Flash programs. This whole thing at Pixlr.com was written in Flash. So now I've got that thing going on. Let me uh, resize this flower thing so it's wide enough for this thing. So I'm going to go to the Free Transform tool, which is Control-T. Okay, Free Transform. And I'm going to grab hold of a corner now notice I'm grabbing hold of a corner and little double arrows show up. And I'm going to hold down the shift key so that it doesn't distort, so that every the sides grow at the same time as the top and bottom. Okay? And just make that thing a little bit larger. And then I'm going to move it around. Now I've got to get my position where I'm going to want it. Um, Right, right away, because when I hit enter with free transform in this program, it crops the image into place. Now, if I didn't, now I'll show you what I mean. You see now it's cropped it. I don't have place to, to move it anymore. So, uh, keep that in mind that you want to get your positioning right. Now, you could, of course, just simply make two copies of this image or just keep this image around and don't close it. Um, but you can also make another layer of this and put it in here so that you have a full version like right there, this layer 2. Call that Flowers Master. And uh, then just simply don't make it visible. Notice the little checkbox next to the right. If I uncheck that, it makes that invisible. And now it's just sitting there as kind of a, uh, a backup. If I want to make a copy of that, I can drag it down to the little new page icon. See the little new page icon right there? And it will actually make a copy of it. And there it calls a copy. Now I can transform that one. Isn't that cool? So uh, then make that visible and do the transform on it. Just keep in mind, after you hit enter, after you've done a free transform, it's going to auto crop it to the size of the canvas size the, or the, uh, the the template size. All right, so that's why you might want to keep an extra sitting around. Uh, another way you could I could have done a similar type of thing would have been to uh, change the layer. But well, let's get back to the free images subject. We now have something sitting in here that I can actually use as a uh, as a background. Um, but back to my discourse on Google and finding Google images. Here we go. <laughs> Another place that people find images, of course, is in the images section. And notice that this already knows that I had done a search previously for commercial reuse with modification. And it found similar. Now you'll always see this labeling at the top of your search when you've got it in that um, in that mode where it's filtering based on whether this thing has commercial reuse with modification. Okay? Um, that means free to use. So you get a lot of images show up 
tons and tons. But one thing I found out uh, last week when I, I was starting to notice that a lot of images that I was finding um, were showing up in the same website. They were constantly showing up over here at Flickr. And Flickr has a section called the Commons. And these are tons of photos that are submitted by um, organizations such as, well, actually, let's go, I'll go show you who all. Here we are. Here's some of the participating institutions. We have tons and tons and tons of comp of different, you know, uh, nonprofits and libraries and uh, colleges that have been submitting their articles, including NASA, putting a lot of pictures in here. Uh, they've been submitting their uh, not articles, but their their photos to this Flickr project. And here you see uh, they have rights. Are you'll see a rights statement alongside any of the pictures that you find in here, and it shows that the copyright is either in the public domain because it's expired or it was injected in the public domain for other reasons. The institution owns the copyright but is not interested in exercise and control or the institution has legal rights sufficient to authorize others to use the work without restrictions. Okay? No known copyright restrictions. That means you can use it commercially for any use. So anything you find in the commons is open season. Okay? And so you can search the commons, as you can see, and it will find images that are already labeled for for reuse and uh, and being able to alter it okay so so that's pretty spectacular I mean you can even get for your banner at AdWords the paper mache cow on Mrs. Malore's car okay which I think would be a real eye grabber and have have people clicking through far more than you probably want them to all right so all right so isn't that super is that that's incredible, isn't it? So let me get you the link to this. Put in the question in the chat box here. There it is. I just pasted that in the chat book. Chat box. It's www.flickr.com slash commons. Another great place to... <laughs> yeah, this is fantastic. I totally agree. <laughs> Definitely, Holly. Um... Here's another uh, great place for them is the Wikimedia. Wikimedia is Wikipedia's place where they put images that are uh, freely usable. Okay, do you see this? This is freely usable media files. And anyone can contribute to these pictures. And this is another incredible repository of stuff. Okay? Oh, and yeah, uh, thanks, Patty. Uh, I just was told Getty is on both Stock Exchange and Flickr Common. So, so they definitely are out to just be finally recognized as the ultimate source. I think they recently bought out like seven of the main stock houses. They're, they've absorbed them all, so... You know, um, Getty is doing a good thing because they're not just being an evil corporation who buys up all the images. They're providing really great images at what I understand are very decent prices, and um, and yet they're also participating in all these these open source, uh, well, public domain and free to use types of uh, pro images. So of course this is um, Wikipedia. They have images in here. They go beyond the images that are in the actual articles. Of course, if you're at Wikipedia and you see an article um, anywhere in Wikipedia, like flowers, well, that's where we found that one. Um, these usually are, and if you click on them, you will find, that is an amazing photo. Uh, see, this is one that has the freely licensed media. Uh, this is a freely licensed category. So, again, um, 
they give here you have the permission permission granted a copy under the terms of this documentation license so now again it's always good to take a look though what the permissions are I for the longest time assumed that uh, the NY Public Library digital gallery was all um, public domain pictures because it's all scans out of all these old books and stuff that they've got but no because they scanned it they took ownership of the pictures that they scanned and they charge for these if you're using for com commercial use and they will come after you if they see you using them for commercial use they are okay for uh, if the web size images are okay only for educational and uh, research use um, otherwise you pay pretty darn dearly for for using uh, this stuff okay it's uh, let's see somewhere I had uh, yeah you see low resolution files materials downloaded may only be used for personal educational or research purposes they may not be used for commercial purposes so that was kind of a surprise and they've got a um, a price list in here somewhere too I think it might be in here but anyway what's what's the difference it's they it's it's not cheap definitely not cheap okay um, they basically want to sell you the tips that they scanned the full-blown tips then you can make uh, web images out of the tips <laughs> but they're still going to sell them to you okay so I was surprised I'm going hey wait a minute these are all old pictures from public domain books I mean these are from books and documents that way predate 1920 aha but that's that's where they got you is that they have modified they consider that modifying the uh, the images significantly by converting them to digital form using their scanners you see and so that's what they're charging you for really is the fact that they are now in digital format whereas these other folks uh, Flickr Commons Wikimedia they're not charging you for the fact that they are in digital format um, or have been converted and these images are actually proclaimed to be in the public domain for whatever reasons and again so between those two and using the two search tools at Google with that labeling uh, with commercial reuse for modification in here and again that's from advanced search see this is, it looks a little bit different when you're in the um, image search but you've got usage rights return images that are labeled for commercial reuse with modification see so out of the choices okay so uh, so that's pretty spectacular so let's rather than uh, finding some flowers let's uh, show some other things that are always useful like um, sky photos uh, off times you'll have an image that uh, would look cool as a detail but the sky looks lousy and um, that would be a great place to go ahead and grab a picture of somebody else's sky and put that so you're peering through it to um, you know through your front image to a sky it's exposed in the back and that's what masking does it allows you to cut holes in the foreground image so that you can see an image that's behind it, like a sky. It's, uh, it takes a little bit of practice, and um, but again, the trick is is to go to you get to the image. Oops, I'm gonna have this. There we go. Select copy image location, and that gets the URL of the image. And sometimes the images there are copies of the images that are even bigger than the um, than the one that they're showing you. But anyway, so copy image location, and then you go into your Pixlr, go to File, Open Image URL, okay, paste in that URL, and it goes and gets it and loads it in. Okay, isn't that spectacular? So, we've been finding some pretty small images lately. One thing that you can do in the Google search if I can find where I put it, there we go, um, is that you can have it sort by sizes. So right now we're in any size. If I need mostly larger size pictures, then it will show you those first. Like here's a really darn big size, 1636 by 1080. Um, 
these are very large so I'd have to really shrink these down substantially to get to the size that I'm needing for for my uh, my banners of course then you can go to medium and there you wind up with a lot of more workable images for banner type things like there's 800 by 533 so uh, so this is a great way to do it you can even not even be so specific if you're just in browsing mood and you want to kind of get inspiration just type in free images and you'll get a ton of stuff to give yourself some inspiration uh, for different types of backgrounds and things like that now keep in mind when you're working with uh, things that are like display network ads the main thing is to, to do is to grab the eye with a strong image and pull them in so it'll read your text so to read your offer and uh, with display ads you always want them to respond to an offer so that they'll take action and, uh, and investigate the offer usually it's a free report or a free offer or if you're just doing branding recognition of course then you're putting your product in front or something like that but um, the best use of display advertising using AdWords and probably any kind of banner advertising is to you do offer style okay so so there you'd want the text to be important all right so uh, so now you got a whole ton of images again always check up here make sure you're still um, in the correct area labeled for commercial reuse with modification and you're good to go okay so uh, let's see oh look at that great psychedelia by golly now one thing I always found kind of curious is that they they limit you to this four pages now, I know there's a ton more images that Google could show me for the term free images <laughs> so it's always curious because it's not the same stuff that comes up here every time I do it um, if, you know but who knows I don't know how the mind of Google works sometimes but it, it limited this to four pages for this thing uh, does anyone have any ideas of <laughs> of how uh, how you get more pages I don't know it's, it's very curious so anyhow um, notice also you have in types down here you can say whether you want faces photos clip arts or line drawing the clip arts thing is really useful when you start wanting to put uh, drawings on top of drawings uh, that is artwork on top of artwork and the reason why is because of this white background okay um, let's see let's see what we go good on top of the flowers I have already I may as well just wing this thing with flowers stay with the flowers thing um, um, well I'm going to take this guy let's see 400 by 400 this will just barely do it so let's click this and again I'll oh aha good I'm so glad this happened notice I'm in Flickr and I've got this little magnifying glass showing up over oh when I zoom in and the magnifier disappears there's a little magnifying glass my icon is turned into this is going to trick you a little bit because if when you right click on it you will notice it didn't come up with the standard menu and uh, Oh yeah, click refresh. I'll try that, Holly. <laughs> um, it was a suggestion for how to get the uh, Google to show more images. But this showed so this photo has some rights reserved, and so it's a good idea maybe to click and find out what those rights are. And uh, here we go. Uh, you can remix. You're free to share, to remix, and make commercial use of the work. How nice! All right, so let's go back to it again. So we say yes. I want this image so how do I get to it look I click on it and my right click still is showing this stuff I click it again it takes me back here here's the secret for getting images from Flickr from their new uh, interface where it says view all sizes click on the size now you're reg in the regular interface and you can right click and copy the image location again okay I ran into this the first time I did this uh, webinar and I didn't expect it 
And uh, yeah, so we actually discovered it during the webinar how to get these images. So copy image location, go to your photo editor again to open image URL, paste in your your URL, and it opens it up. Okay. Now this is a little bit large, of course, for putting in here. Let's do that old Control A to select all, Control C to copy go up here and select our banner and control V to paste and now I've got that in there I can move it around now obviously it's way too large I'm gonna just kind of place this over on the left side of my thing you're saying oh but all this white all that whites in the way you'll see in just a second what happens next now control T to the uh, thing oh I'm still in this one sec there we go uh, free transform and the secret to using free transform is to hold shift while dragging the corners okay if you drag the sides it will distort whether you have shift held or not okay you see what I'm saying so let me just hit escape to get out of that and do it again here we go so hold shift and drag the corners to resize your image and I'll put this over here and uh, might be a strong enough image to withstand being there on top of all strong flowers um, actually maybe I'll flip it too there we go and put it over on this side there we are that's exactly what I'll do alrighty when I hit enter it takes and it becomes an image but now as you say it's got this white thing well this is where Pixlr is very Photoshop powerful it has blending modes that it gives you so you don't have to mask this image out to uh, hide the the white part the only problem you're going to see is that the chest here of the bird is also going to be affected when I do it this way so let me just show you what I'm talking about when you click down here in the lower left hand corner of the layers menu it brings up a thing that allows me to change the opacity in other words how how invisible or visible this thing is how much you can see through it but it also has these modes and these modes are called blending modes in Photoshop uh, if I use darken you'll see that it the white completely disappears but as I mentioned I'm seeing through any white sections here also uh, the same another tool you might use in regular line art that didn't have any white in the middle might be multiply would do a similar type of thing multiply is attempting to uh, to show more of the bird but it's still it's still failing when it comes to showing the white parts of the bird okay so this is when you have regular line art that's just black like um, pen and ink types of things then this trick of using the modes works fantastic in fact I'll even go and get another we'll go and get another uh, image that really is that here we are like this okay click that right click click the medium 640 right click copy image location go to my editor open image URL and paste it in and there's my heart select all control A control C for copy get it out of the way click on my image control V control T to transform it and way down here transform to a smaller thing now this still is going to show though the white sections of this thing this image is going to show through using just the blending modes okay so, but this is perfect because it lets me show you some of the selection tools alright so again I've got that selected I select uh, say multiply and I get the image the white has been removed or I could have used darken as I said and, uh, and I'm seeing through it okay I see through anywhere where it was white anywhere where the pixels are lighter 
color than the background I see through. So the thing to do with these um, with these blending modes is to try them all out and see what you get uh, when you mess around with them. Look at that, it inverted it in a strange way. Some of them will be frustrating. You'll go, well, what the heck does that do? It doesn't seem to do anything. Others will just not do what you expected them to do. All right? But, uh, but the main thing with these is you've got to go through and experiment with them. And then you find out what they do and you start getting more comfortable with playing with them. All right, so, but in these two images, it's perfect examples of when, we, when you need a mask instead, when just, just changing the blending mode isn't going to be enough because you want to show some of the white. So I'm going to do this with the flower, I'm going, I mean with the uh, bird. I'm going to make the bird be um, just in normal mode. So let's get, we better label our things here. So layer five, we'll call, we'll double click on there and call it heart and then just click off and it will take layer four and you notice I'm using the checkbox to show and hide things so I know what's what here's my bird and click off and I'm noticing it's giving a little bit of, okay so when you, you select the item that you want to change by clicking on it and then I'm going to change it blending mode back to normal okay okay so let's let's kind of zoom in on this entire affair here so I'm going to pick the zoom tool which of course is just hit the letter Z and it will go to the zoom tool and make this substantially larger fill your screen and go in here so I can see some pixels being selected now this might have been better to do before we shrank down the image but um, but then again maybe not I'm going to select the white background by using the magic wand tool this is a very crude way to select things but it it works just fine for most uh, situations where you're doing banners and all the images are pretty small anyway or you really don't have that many pixels so that's up here that little sparkly wand called the magic wand tool and it's the letter W to bring it up so hit Z and you get the zoom tool hit W and you get the wand tool and when I click on the outside it selects the pixels up to the edge now it has a thing called tolerance so if it's selecting too much if it was selecting into the head, set, head here for instance which I don't think it quite is I think I'm okay but if it was selecting too far and getting too much into the grays you change this tolerance setting up here and that cuts down on how uh, how sensitive the the, the selection is okay if you set it really really high uh, it just picks everything now with contiguous selected it means it won't pick the white that's inside on the other side of this border here so you see I have a dark border and there is white on the inside and white in here but it won't jump <laughs> jump the fence so to speak to get to that if you unclick this and select then it will uh, it'll select everything including okay now let me deselect with control D there we go and put contiguous on once in a while anti-alias up here is not a desirable trait you want a harder edge selection that uh, selects harder into the um, sort of fuzz that's around the edges of things that makes them blend a little bit better uh, in the original picture but sometimes that's detrimental to your selection when you check this off the effects of the tolerance become all the much more um, sensitive because the tolerance determines how far into the kind of fade that that edge had okay if you zoom in on a, on a hard edge you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about this doesn't really show it very well but um, you can see somewhat that on the outside of a dark section it's like fades from a black to a dark gray to a lighter gray to a very light gray 
this tolerance setting would determine if the anti-alias is turned off, how far, how deep into that fading the uh, selection would have gone to give you a thing. Uh, anti-alias makes it so that the selection adds its own kind of like a, well, it counts for the fact that there's anti-aliasing anyway, or it will anti it will actually add a bit of this kind of gray structure to the mask, to the, uh, the way that the selection is made. Kind of a feathering effect. Okay? Alright, so anyway, let's go ahead and select this. It's pretty easy selection since everything around this is white. And you're probably just dying to know what happens next, okay? What happens next is this little, the second button over here on the bottom of the layers, that little square with a circle in it, that creates a mask out of the selection. However, if I just selected this right now, you'll see what happens. Look, the bird disappeared. Well, isn't that not convenient? The reason why that is, is because the mask occurs, uh, it's basically taking and keeping what you've selected, which to me is a little bit backwards. Because um, most of the time, you're selecting out the parts that you want to get rid of. <laughs> and you're not, but it's just figuring, well, you must have made a good selection, and what you selected is what you want to keep. All right, so now we know that that's what it does. When I make the selection of the white, the part I want to get rid of, I have to switch that. I have to invert the selection so that the part that's selected is the part I want to keep. And to do that is easy. You just go up to Edit, and right here, Invert Selection is the secret. Right there. Okay? Invert Selection. Now, if you mess up with the selection and uh, you want to start over again, you simply do this Deselect All, which is Control D. And that will get rid of your selection altogether so you can start fresh. All right, so we're going to invert the selection. And you can hardly tell that anything's happened here. Um, it looks like everything in the world has just been selected. And then you click that and bingo. Lois, and now your bird is standing alone. Now, uh, I notice that my, uh, my edge is a little bit, a little bit off. I'm showing a little bit of whiteness, white space around there. And that would be that anti-alias thing that I was talking about. So uh, why don't we go ahead and deselect, and we'll uh, try the same thing with the anti-aliasing turned off, and just see what the difference is. Okay, so that, go up here, make my selection, invert the selection, and make the mask. And see, it's, it's worse because I didn't select a tolerance. See all the little white specks around the thing? I didn't select a tolerance that was adequate to dig into that. So, simply would uh, do some experimentation until it gets right. So, uh, let's see, I'll lower the tolerance a little bit. Down to maybe 8. And see if that makes things tighter or looser. It might be in this case that I'd want to have um, the anti-aliasing on. Now, I'm just being picky, of course, now. Yeah, that to me, that makes things far worse. So let's stick with anti-aliasing being on. And invert to selection. And that's, uh, <laughs> it is worse. Well, you know, it's a live uh, webinar, and that's what it's supposed to be like. So uh, let me up the tolerance. There we go. You'll eventually find one that seems to be working right with the types of images that you're you're dealing with, and then uh, then it won't be so much of a so much of a thing. So look at 31 made it jump jump the hoop. What did we have it at 23 before? I think that was a good one. So okay, invert D selection and mask it. And that's going to be good enough. Heck, this is uh. Of course, we're talking about a little teeny weeny image, and here I am being all picky about one pixel showing. All right, so now we have, you can tell I must have been a Photoshop production guy at one time, so I'm being all, you know, like that. And uh, so now we have it, though, where this thing, you see through it, it's the transparency has been applied by the mask. And 
so you see through the white, you're actually seeing through the, the, the selected portion, what used to be white, and seeing through to the background. So this will have a million and one uses. Um, in this hearts situation, a similar type of thing would have occurred where if I wanted the white portion of the heart to be showing, put it back to normal, again, just to go through this again, make my selection. This is a good hard edge, so it should be fine. Invert that selection, go to edit, invert selection, and then add the mask. And as you see now, it's, uh, it's kept the white portion in the middle so that I have a clear little heart with a white in the center. Okay? All right, so that's great. We've got, you learned something about masking and blending modes. Uh, it would be kind of nice to get a image that actually works just fine with um, with any blending mode. Let's see. I'm gonna I'm gonna skier. There's a perfect example. I used this last week. Now again, and I'm glad I came up to another Flickr image. Right click. Go to the original, or large, or medium, 640, any one of these. It takes you to the full image. Copy the image location. Go to open, open image URL and paste it in. Isn't this great? I'm not having to download anything to my hard drive. This is all being done online. There's nothing on my hard drive yet. Okay? So in this case, the multiply trick is going to work just fine. So control A to select all, control C to copy. I can actually get rid of that now. Control V to paste. Uh, control T to resize it. And holding shift down and drag in a corner. I can grab hold of this thing and make it really small. Here we are. Put them up there. and hit enter and for this one using the multiply uh, blending mode is going to work just fine so drag that down so I see multiply and there we go and as you see using multiply or using darken would have also been fine in this case sometimes darken looks better but um, as you see since that it was fine to let the white disappear. Um, I didn't have to use the uh, selection. Okay, so any questions yet since I've gone through selections and blending modes and lots of complicated stuff like that? You almost think this should say something, shouldn't I? Shouldn't I? Uh, I heart skiing on Bird Mountain. <laughs> it should say something like Uh-huh. Okay, now you can, how to change the color of the skier or the heart? That's a good question. There's a few different ways you could actually do that. Um, one way would be to uh, colorize the thing using um, a, let's, let's do this this way. I'm going to do that to this. Let me deselect. There's some uh, different adjustment things. You have uh, hue saturation, for instance, will allow colorizing. See the little box right here that says colorize? And uh, that colorizes the entire thing. If it's just the black you wanted colorized, of course, if you wanted to change the black to another color, um, that could be done by putting it against a, uh, a different color background and inverting the thing and, and doing some of those blending mode tricks or changing the opacity um, you know using these blending mode things what I would do in this case is I would in fact this is a good case in point if you want to use the original image and you got the little lock on it see the lock to the right of background double click the lock and it turns it into something with the name layer zero so I can call that heart and then click off now I can add another layer below it and you see these layers move so I can change it from being above or below just by dragging on it and dropping it 
And uh, now I can fill up this layer with a, um, with a color, for instance, by using the, uh, the color bucket tool and selecting a color from here. Now notice that this is the color pick selector. I was going to wait till we got to uh, text for this, but this is just as good. It starts off in black. In other words, the darkness is all the way to black. Okay, This is a, called a hue, saturation, and lightness selector. It starts off with the lightness all the way down. You drag it over to the right and it drags the lightness and saturation up. Or you can have just the lightness all the way up, which of course would make it white. And it shows you a preview over here. It also shows you associated related colors in here, which you can select to get to those colors. And, uh, and you can change the entire hue. Okay, So we'll pick a uh, reddish color. And that's now the color here. And I will pour that using the um, paintbrush tool into the back. So now you see that this layer is we don't see it because this white is in front of it but uh, you see it turn off the heart and you see that it's just a big hunk of red now I can select up here and there's a few different things you can do you can change the opacity of course to show different amounts of the background through and see it's going from pink to redder and redder because I'm mixing these two together using its opacity but these blending mode things that's the thing notice add look at that bingo it changed the black pixels and it added the values of the pixels below it that's what all these what the reason they call them blending modes is because you're blending um, the layer above with the values of the layers below so there you go so that might have been too easy because I just went to the very first blending mode and and it made exactly what I want I see yeah. that hardly seems fair right but um, there's other blending modes that will, will do various different things. Like I say, you've sometimes just got to experiment. There, the darken makes it so that the background shows through. Wherever, things, wherever the top layer is darker than the, layer, than the pixels behind, it makes the top layer appear. That's what, how darken works. Uh, difference does this amazing thing. I don't know where it gets blue out of the combination of white and red. But that's math for you. It's, all it's doing is doing math on the pixel values. See? Um, erase, of course, isn't doing anything for us in that case. Hard light makes kind of a curious, uh, weird edged things. <laughs> Invert's not it either. Layer's not it either. Lighten does similar to add, as you can see. Um, in this case, because I'm because I'm dealing with black is why because black is my top color overlay does a combination again screen does another similar thing to um, add and uh, and lighten and then you have subtract okay which makes uh, a very total difference in that it took what was black and made it red and took what was white and made it black okay so uh, so there, now I think you've got an answer of that's how you would change some of those values. Okay, does that satisfy you? And uh, so there's, of course, our first one being just, just as a matter of convenience. <laughs> so, okay, so then you could take this and you could um, flatten this image and take it into the other one okay and then you could do the same thing where you select and to cut out the edge uh, you can unfortunately I didn't find an easy way to bring masked you know images you've already masked into um, into another image into another one just by copy and paste but I didn't really try either the way you would do that is you would go ahead and do what's called flattening and flattening is done up here in the layer and you see where it says flatten image flattening takes what you finally come up with okay what you're seeing on the screen and it combines the two layers flattening them into a single layer so that it's easy to copy paste and drop it in 
and pretty much has to be done to switch, switch various results from one to another. So, uh, so let's go ahead and we'll do that. I'll show a flatten. Flatten and you see it's only one layer. Now I can easily do a select all and you see the little marching ants around the edge. Copy, move to my other image and paste. Um, let's go ahead and get the selection tool out and right away make our selection. Um, let's see. Look at that. Let me let's let me cut that right out, huh? By golly, isn't that interesting? Now I think it may have been big. Well, actually, I'm not sure what to do in this case. Is <laughs> it only made the selection seemingly to the bottom here? Eh, let me just find something out. Yeah, sure enough. Okay, undo. This is the magic of undo. By the way, you have tons of undos. There is a history box here. And you can undo simply by scrolling up to the point that you want to undo to and hitting the, uh, the thing you want to undo to. Okay, that you want to go back to. So, um, so let's just get rid of the wand tool for now. I'm going to go ahead and resize, transform. Apparently, one thing, one big difference between this and Photoshop is that it does not allow the transform, the, the selection, to go outside the bounds of the canvas, whereas Photoshop throws in a little thing called Big Canvas that they've been doing since, uh, I think, CS. That would have worked on the entire image, even though it's not visible in this window where the canvas is. But uh, this doesn't. It only works on what's actually visible in the canvas. Okay. Now this, of course, is a case in point. I could have. In fact, let me just go ahead and get rid of uh, get rid of this layer. Oh, you get rid of a layer, by the way, by dragging it to the trash. See a little trash can, or just by selecting the layer and hitting the trash can. But a lot of people love dragging to the trash, so they made that viable where it's still possible in Photoshop. Alrighty, so uh, I'm going to go back to this original here. I'm going to deselect it and select my outside. There we go. Go ahead and invert the selection and make a mask. Now I've got this mask here, okay? And you then do what's called apply the mask. And um, see where it says uh, uh, apply layer mask? When you apply the layer mask, notice the little checkerboards? Those are transparent pixels. Now, uh, when you're, if you saved this as a JPEG, um, the transparency would go away and this would turn white because JPEG doesn't support transparency. GIF files, GIF files, they do support it. So do the new PNG files, which I'm so glad have become a growing standard. PNG. Um, they support this transparency, so even after I saved it as a PNG, it would keep the transparency so I could use this in any image, uh, any website, and it would have a nice clean edge. So PNG and GIF files. For our purposes, wanting to bring this into here, I did this because I wanted you to see how I could flatten the image, create a mask, and then select all and copy, go over to my other, and paste it. And look at that. Lo and behold, oops, do I select, remove, V for move, there we go. And lo and behold, look at that. It's transparency copies over. So, so you want to do that kind of maneuver, I would recommend. And I was really thinking I should have done that even when I showed you my original bird. Uh, is work on the original first, get it so that it's already masked and with transparency. Now again, the steps for that are, let me go through that. Let's do some, uh, some major undoing here. Yes, we'll go back before I merge the layers. So I had done my paint bucket tool to make layer one red and that's below. I changed the blending mode to add on the upper one to get this red heart. Then I go in and I make a selection around the outside. Now if I wanted to select out the inside pixels too, that's where you would take off the contiguous checkbox. So let me just deselect and show you that. 
and you see now it's selected all things that are white okay we'll go ahead with that one for for fun and giggles here and uh, now I've selected it I make my mask oh no I don't hold it nobody stopped me nobody stopped me uh, we gotta flatten first so under layer again that's where you go to apply layer mask no we want flatten first right? flatten image there we go so flatten image makes it into one image select with contiguous turned off we'll select all the white inside and out now I go ahead and invert the selection because I don't want the, to show the white I want to show the red and that doesn't have a shortcut key by the way and then make my mask okay so now I've got a mask I go ahead up to layer apply layer mask and now it's flattened and it's got the red part with transparency so that you'll see through now I select all with control A copy with control C go back to here oh I don't need that there we go <laughs> Deselect, deselect. Here we go. Back to my move tool. There we go, paste. And there we have it all selected. So now I get my transform tool out. Drag the corners by holding the shift key till it's sized. Now this doesn't work so great on this image because I don't have any really light areas for it to work on, but, but it was mostly for illustration. I wanted you to see the idea. Okay, so where should I put it? Where should I put it? That's good enough. There we are. And uh, by the way, you can tweak. You can move things around using the arrow keys. When you have the move tool selected, the arrow keys up, down, left, and right all work. Okay. All righty. Um, so now you've seen how to work on something, how to get transparency so that you've applied an actual layer mask. Now this is really great advanced stuff that you guys are taking in and you will have uh, the uh, recording later on and uh, because I know you'll be wanting to review all of this stuff and uh, but I'll have that recording up and I'll email you as it comes. Or And if you don't see it coming up quick enough or you didn't get the email, just email me at uh, tbritton at gmail.com and, uh, and I'll make sure you get it, okay? But um, fortunately, that's a good reason we're forgiving your email when you um, register for these things. All right, let's move on to text. Let me save. You know what? Let's go ahead. I'm going to save this image since I worked so hard on it. I'm going to say yes. And the reason I'm saving that is I want you to see how the Pixlr library works. Now, notice it came up the Pixlr library and it's asking me to sign in. Well, you haven't signed in yet, so click right here where it says sign up to Pixlr. Now, I wouldn't put masters here. I would get a copy to your hard drive and to a couple other locations, but the power of having this is that you've got a copy up there in the cloud. I don't know, the reason I don't want to depend on anybody who's got cloud storage right now is they could be overwhelmed or they could be crashed someday uh, I don't know how redundant their storage is or even if Pixlr will still be around next year you just never know it's the internet so the best thing to do is just play it safe but but while they're there look you can sign up to Pixlr you simply put in your name email password and repeat the password and and it creates an account for you bingo just like that so let me just go here so I'm going to go ahead and sign in and the formats that you can save when you're saving to the Pixlr library that they give you is that you can save it as a layered Pixlr image and you can do that on your hard drive too where you're actually saving the entire thing with layers and all okay to give you an idea of why that's so valuable is uh oh I went to close it without without saving it. Alright, it doesn't matter. Um 
reason that's so valuable is to say I want to save this this thing as we're doing it right now. Um, good Lord, I can't wait. When did I move here? There we go. Okay. Uh, go to File, Save, Pixel Library. I'm already logged in. Save as the, P the PXD. So now I've got all my layers intact so that I can come back to this and reuse any of these layers anytime or whatever. So I'll call this the flower example. And it saves it into this Pixlr library. Now what's really great about that being the layers, oh, and you can make, you can have multiple folders which you can create when you're in there. And it's working, 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 working. I guess I've made a pretty big image by now. There we go. Now, let me hit save again. The other places you can save are Facebook, but only as only as JPEGs. So if you've got any images that you've used transparency by making a mask, you've got to save them as that, uh, you know, as a PNG file to save that transparency to use it later. I mean, as a PXD or as a PNG where the transparency is kept. Okay? I think the transparency is probably kept in the TIFF, but it's not a multi-layered TIFF. It is a one-layer TIFF. Even if you, it flattens it, in other words, when it makes the TIFF file. TIFFs are a special format used by printers uh, a ton. Okay? In fact, most printers ask you for a TIFF file. Although, I'm working on a book right now. I've got a, uh, my publisher has asked for all the files to be either in PNG or JPEG, high quality PNG or JPEG. I was surprised. So I used to teach printing, and and everything had to be TIFF back, no, just five years ago. But anyhow, so if you want the transparency, you have to save it to your Pixlr library or to your hard drive. Uh, Emeo is another place that lets you save PNGs to save transparency. That is a uh, utility that I've never even heard of before I got Pixlr. It may be European, I'm not sure, but you can sign up for an Emeo um, account as well. Facebook, like I said, is JPEG only. Flickr is JPEG only. Picasa is JPEG only. Okay? So there you go. Um, now, might be... Yeah, JPEG only. So there you have it. That's, that's the deal with those. So if you want to save in a transparency, you've got to save it either in your Pixlr library, on your hard drive, or up at Emeo. I would definitely save both places, um, but it's just great that the Pixlr library, knows Emeo lets you do JPEG or PNG, but not uh, the layered files, okay? You always want to save a copy of your layers, either on your hard drive or up in your Pixlr library, uh, because this way you can come back at any time, change a few aspects of it. I can, you know, come back and I can say, well, get rid of the skier, you know, is that that guy? Oh, well, that's that one. There we go. Get rid of the skier. And then save it again with the skier hidden. Now notice it's not deleted. It's just hidden. Okay? Or I can decide, you know, I really needed that skier to be a different size. So I can come back in and do the control T and do the uh, free transform again with shift held down. Now one warning, of course, is if you ever are cropping the thing off of the edge, you will get it cut off. It'll crop it. It'll cut it at the uh, layer of the canvas. Okay? So, uh, anyway. That that might be one reason to sometimes do your banners in a larger size first. Do your layouts um, and then crop it later. I don't know. Those are all just procedural decisions you might make. But let's get to text. What do you say? Have we done enough with image manipulating? Would you like, we have to get to text, but quick. So that's the little A down here, the type tool. And the type tool you get to with the T. You just hit T and it lights up. So no control or anything like that. Just hit the letter on the keyboard and it comes up with the type tool. When you click on the type tool and you have it selected, you see you get a an I bar, which just appears when I zoom in. Isn't that great? Uh, clicking on with the I bar brings up little text box. Now you notice there's no center or anything like that. Uh, 
that kind of formatting, if you wanted to do centering with two things, like um, this is not, I'm going to hit enter, centered. There you go. So if I wanted that to be centered, I would have to put a, some spaces in there with my space bar. So that's pretty crude. But it at least lets you get along the ideas. Or I could do the word centered um, simply on its own layer, on a separate layer. Uh, so let's go ahead and we'll fiddle with the, see you can fiddle with the size. You can change to bold. It lets you give a preview. Italic or bold italic. Okay, so I'll do bold. You can change the color and the color picker comes up. And this is the color picker that I was showing you a minute ago. It's still in the previous color. And it lets you pick variations of the previous colors that you've used in here. But uh, And that's kind of nice, of course. With the this color picker, you notice the sliders show you an anticipation of what color you'll get by moving them. Uh, what result you'll get. And that's a really nice feature. Do you see what I mean? It shows in the hue the rainbow directions you'd be moving through. And the saturation shows you how strong the color would be. And in the lightness it shows you how dark the color will become by moving that slider. Um, RGB does a similar thing as they show you since it's hard to really calculate this in your mind. It shows you what the result of moving the slider will become by moving it in either direction. So if I cut out the blue and lower the amount of blue, then my pink will become more orangey. You see what I'm saying? If I increase the green, it will become more yellowish. Uh, so, as you can see, and it shows you your preview up here. And it still also gives you the related colors. It shows, it shows you what the web hex, hexadecimal color is, if you wanted to use this in your cascading style sheets as a color uh, assignment for your fonts in the rest of the text or in some text like a heading text so you have that that you can put in as a class um, and uh, you also have the values in RGB uh, then that you can use in other programs now Photoshop doesn't use HSL although they do have a plugin that lets you um, so you would just use these RGB values if you were trying to pop the same colors into Photoshop or many other programs, okay? Then you have the web colors, and this shows you the 216 color, web safe colors. In case you still had a concern that somebody might have a 1996 Windows uh, 98 computer that they were viewing uh, your thing on, and some colors might not work on their, uh, in their browser. Um, not as likely today as it used to be, where uh, people would be viewing things in 256 colors and that's just very very unusual but if you're doing international stuff where you're going to have people viewing it on, on old machines then this is a concern and you, so you'd want to be using some web safe colors okay it's a limit it's only 216 colors total but uh, but it's they this has come up by engineers not designers so it's not the greatest colors in the world However, the most exciting thing about text color is this, this that you just added is this IMG or image color selector. This is extracting colors that are in the image itself. All right? It is actually looking at the image and showing you colors that are actually in the image itself. This is a gold mine, especially if you're just an okay designer and can't do this kind of stuff off the top of your head. Actually having the colors to work from from the uh, from the actual image is a gold mine from a design standpoint because it lets you pick related colors and so I can get this related color and then even go through and select other related colors and they still are going to fall within the colors that are relate that relate with colors that are in my uh, main image so you still got to think in terms of readability of course and and stuff like that but uh, but it's giving you a whole lot of literally designer colors to choose from so that you're not so tempted to just to go with the black and white which is uh, you know how I'm always tempted because I'm designer you know 
that part that, that part of my brain was removed or something. So uh, so yeah, so there's a really nice uh, strong color, and it's got readability even on top of this mixed thing. If I move it into another position, perhaps. But as you see, tons of things. And now that I've picked this color, I can go back to my RGB or my HSL selector and modify it in here too. As long as I'm only changing saturation or lightness, I'm still in the realm of being a related color, relative color. And again, don't forget about these selectors up here, the four little squares underneath, are giving you four more relative colors that are relative to some content that's in the, in the uh, master here. So let's go ahead and I'm going to pick that as my uh, color for that. And click OK. And then I'm just going to click again in here. And because I clicked in a different location, I'm not editing. If I clicked right on top of this uh, text here, it would have brought me in to be able to edit my text, which is great. So, again, we'll have it centered. There we go. Now, this would have been a great place to maybe go have gone and grabbed that color while I could. Okay? Because it's gone and gone back to the original color. Uh, fortunately, I know it was that burgundy. But this is where this right here is really handy. You can grab this and paste it into another color choice. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take this layer centered and throw it away. And just do that one again. But first I'm going to edit this one. See where it says this is not? Look at its color and copy that color. So control C with it selected and then click elsewhere to make my next layer and select that paste in that code and bingo I'm golden okay make that bold italic and now it's not centered so I get my move tool and I move it into position anywhere I want okay okay now there are so many fonts available to us it's not even funny let me go back to the selection tool and select this um, pretty much I'm not sure exactly how this is going to work across computers but you have so many fonts this is every font I've got on my computer apparently is available to me or these ones that they've got up there. I don't know. I have so many fonts, I have no idea even what I've got. This might be fonts that they're offering you. Um, I see that, look at that, that italic is coming coming off the edge. I don't know what that's about. I'd have to put in a space to show the side of the D. But that's proper italic treatments anyway. Whenever you italicize, you always italicize the following space as well, okay? Did you know that? You always italicize the space at the end of the word so that these extenders don't uh, get chopped off or they don't butt up into the, uh, the word that's next to them. Okay, so you always italicize the last letter and the space that's right after. So if you're just typing in here, that's what I'm saying, you just add a space to the end to, and that makes it so it's large enough. I'm glad that happened because I wouldn't have thought to mention that. Okay. Now, you might be saying, well, okay, that's still not the greatest readability here, Terry. You know, what are you, you're going to leave it like that? I can't even read it. So, it's not the greatest ad copy either, I'm sure. But let's go in and play around with another cool feature. See, I didn't cover this little box called Layer Styles yet. And that little box is going to make this thing completely changed because there's where you have your drop shadow, inner shadow, bevel, outer glow, and inner glow possibilities. What you do is you select the one that you want and you see it add, it's adding drop shadow and I click on the word drop shadow to bring up its options. Okay? So here I've got I can control the opacity of my drop shadow, I can control my color and again I still have that color saved so I can paste it in there again and I drop the opacity of it so it's not full strength to see. It's the same color. I can change the distance. And one kind of cool thing is to make the distance be zero 
and uh, and then change the size, and you get this fuzz effect, and that's that's uh, that's just kind of cool. Um, you can since you can make these various colors, you can make kind of a glowing effect similar to an outer glow just by using the uh, drop shadow effect, and uh, so. And of course you've got your angle and all that kind of stuff too. So let's um here we go. So you see the angle changes where it exists, where it's coming from in terms of that. So that's one way to make uh the lettering stand out against the background. Another way is to use the outer glow. Um you would pick a color that's lighter of course. And um it would have to be substantially lighter in this case, I think. All right, and and we have it. Oh, it doesn't give you a preview when you're picking the color, apparently. No, it doesn't. I have to pick my color and then hit OK and see it. But as you see, it puts an outer glow, like an outline, outlining around the edge. You can change how much it is, and this really keeps your text being visible and readable. Because remember, the whole point of this exercise is to have interesting graphics that are going to pull your eye in but for sure it's got the text is what it's all about okay so I can change my opacity I can change my hardness which changes how diffused the uh, glow is and the size of course changes how big it's circulating okay and then you get your colors all right now again Notice this says use I'm still staying this image color picker because it's great. I can still pick among from among pictures, I mean uh, colors that are relative to the entire image. So I'm not just making kind of a guess at what might be a nice color. I'm actually picking relative colors. So uh, from a designer standpoint, I'm really being high end from a designer standpoint because this would normally be done by using swatch books and comparison charts and all this kind of uh tools that people with that are in design would have. Here I got it right there showing what the relative colors are and I can even go further and uh, and select colors from within that are still rel relative. Okay. Um, Inner Glow does a similar type of thing but on the inside it's not as useful but it's, it's, it's great for some applications. And Bevel makes it have a beveled look and can also uh, be useful sometimes. You can change the direction of the bevel so that it, see it looks like it's protruding or, or coming out of the page. That's if I'm doing an inner or I can do an outer bevel or a full bevel. So that's pretty darn fancy for free, won't you think? And uh, I can change the highlights colors and again, it doesn't give me a preview. I have to select the color and then and go in. Um, give me my shadows colors. I can pick a dark purple and uh, and change my angles, as I said. So you see how that works? Pretty neat, huh? Okay, so um, so that's how you make your text stand out. So let's do the same thing with this one pick the this is not and notice it does fill in the the layer it tells you what you typed in there so it makes it easy to identify which is which so again we pick on that we're going to just just going to add an outer glow to this one click on the word outer glow to bring up the editor click on the color and bring up a color that uh would be good I'll do go with a um a lilac -y type of a thing there we are and uh, and like I said, the hardness changes how hard the edge is, how diffused it is. Uh, you can change the distance, how far it glows out. And um, so you have quite a few capabilities here. And the opacity makes how much you're seeing through it to the back, to what's behind it. Okay. All right. So we've en enhanced the uh, readability massively by doing this and uh, now you can do this with objects too I mean I can take my bird and give it a uh, give it glows you can do this with any object um, so I'll go ahead and give it an outer glow 
And I'll use a light. There we are. And you see that made that stand out a bit. So, see, on off. Oh, we're going to reset. Yeah, don't get too crazy clicking on those things. It resets on you. There we are. Alrighty. Okay. Everybody having fun yet? That's pretty cool stuff, isn't it? It really makes the text clear as can be. Um, so this is another good point to open it up to questions. Uh, any need to know anything more about the text editing? Like, oh, and one thing I did want to emphasize is that, uh, oh, I went and made an extra text layer I didn't need. Throw that out. That I'm not sure where these fonts are coming from. Um, there we go. I have to have that s selected. I'm not sure where the fonts are coming from, whether they're from my machine or whether they actually are offering this huge number of fonts um, for me to choose from. Because uh, that's my one concern of mine. This is an online program. Am I going to come up on another to edit this thing in another person's machine and only have their fonts available? You know, I actually don't know the answer to that. But, uh, but hopefully um, it retains the fonts. Of course, once I click OK, as far as the program is concerned, it's image material, but to come in and edit it later, it's, it is drawing from the fonts. It's then drawing, using it and drawing a uh, vector image, you know, uh, text out of that. So, uh, but yeah, that's, it's quite a lot of fonts to be, to be choosing from. Now, again, though, I want to mention, if you wanted to edit text, click on the layer first, and then having the uh, having the tool open oops having the tool open then click on your thing that you want to click click on the text um, for this one click on that one got it okay any questions nobody's got a single question I figured I'm your brains would be yeah, I could probably uh, fry eggs on your brains by now. It looks like looks like we got some happiness going on around here. All right, now I do want to go on and mention that we've just scratched the surface of this program. Let me go ahead and save this image in my Pixlr library as a layer. Here we go. And um, this program has a full venue of filters, including some filters I've never even heard of before. Uh, Glamour Glow is popular with some people in the text uh, community. Um, I was I was advised that I, I would like it. I am not. I since I already have a glow on there, it's probably not visible. Um, let's see. But we have many, many, many different um, uh, filters. Now, there's, some of them are really crazy. Let me just work from this one here. There, that, for instance. I'd say that qualifies as pretty crazy. What do you think? Crazy? It's uh, called Kaleidoscope. And I can change the size. I can change the horizontal aspect of where it's, where it's centered or not, the vertical, how it's centered, okay, and it's called kaleidoscope. What do you think of that? Mm -hmm. And then of course undo brings me back. Um, a friend of mine was messing around with this and said that uh, there was something in here that they managed to find that I had never even heard of before. And, uh, of course, water swirl. Oh, yeah. Cancel. Um, well, so you've got your filters that you can fool around with. You've got a bunch of different adjustment things for changing the brightness and contrast, which I recommend against using. And I'll tell you why. 
if there are any light colored pixels, like uh, say it's a snow scene, and you use brightness and contrast, um, if you move it in the direction of brighter, and there's some light colored pixels already, they'll be pushed kind of all the way off the edge of the cliff to pure white. And there's no way to recover from that and bring them back again if you went too far. They're literally pushed off a cliff. Everything that had those values of uh, those high number values before all become 255. They all become the top level value. And they won't come back again when you move the slider the other way, or especially if you come back to it another day. There's no way to recover. So always use the levels or the curves uh, controls to do any kind of brightness or uh, brightness adjustment. Uh, drag from the center to change the mid-range tones. Uh, push up the top to change the light, just the whites. But you see I'm leaving the very top one alone, so I'm never pushing anything off of the edge. Nothing's, I'm leaving the very brightest pixels alone, so nothing ever becomes totally destroyed. That's the point. Same thing with the darks. These, um, these darker colors are a subtle darkness. If I used the brightness contrast in, to darken or to make more contrast, it could push the darks off the edge and they'll never be recoverable again. The best way to get more contrast in a picture is to make just make this curve steeper. Okay? And that will uh, that will accomplish the same effect. Um, so just a little uh, aside there. It, uh, some people also will just drag the, the, the bottom one across. So let me go ahead and hit cancel and show you that again. So it's under adjustment, curves, and in that case you would drag the bottom one over here. Though I wouldn't, but some people would. And the top one over there. Now you have RGB, or you can just do the red, green, or blue and change just values of only the red, green, or blue pixels. That's useful when you're doing color correcting. Uh, if you've got a, a color cast, then you can get rid of it using this tool. Say you've got a blue cast in everything or a reddish cast in everything, you can use that. Okay? So uh, so that's the curves control. Um, again, most of the time the biggest changes you want to do are just dragging the center. That's the equivalent of using the levels control. Okay? That's what the under adjustment what levels does for you. Uh, moving this right here. It's doing the same thing and moving these changes is similar to moving the um, the extreme bottom left or the extreme upper right of the control okay uh, with some images you've got you want to cut cut back so that you're making getting rid of a you'll have a slope here and you'll want to get rid of a bunch of um, extraneous garbage and bring things right up to the edges of where the real colors start kicking in well, that's a little vague, what I just said. Let's say take this picture instead as an example. It might show your curves. Well, actually, uh, you just show the histogram. Eh, not a good example. It's got too, this has too much good color across the board. Um, levels. Yeah, you see how this has, has color across the board? Um, so it's all kind of up there. You'll have some images that dip off rather radically way over here. So it'll be white from this point here all the way to the left. Or it'll be white from this point here all the way to the right. That's meaning that it's usually a grayish kind of a picture that doesn't have a lot of contrast. The equivalent of making the curve steeper would be to move this thing up to the edge of where the mountain you know, the edge of the mountain was. Uh, and adding contrast this way would be to this, pulling in this direction. Pulling in these two directions closer to each other always makes for more contrast. And the eye loves contrast, so it always makes the picture seem more vivid. Whenever you're in RGB, same time as you're making something more vivid, you're also making it more saturated. So, um, so the colors really start popping out and seeming extremely strong. As you can see right there, I'm uh, I'm making the colors really, really powerful there. It's probably much too powerful. And the center one is called the gamma, and that change that's 
also affecting your contrast. It's changing where the where it considers the grays to be. So this is really good for making a picture that was just okay, but had a little bit of grayishness to it. Uh, really come out and pop. You got your so your levels control is easy, and your curves control is just a, another interface for very similar types of uh, changes. Except that you can. It's as if you had more of these sliders positioned at different locations because you can uh, you can click on any part of that line and drag it around. Output levels you typically don't have to worry about unless you're going to print and it's coming out too dark in your prints. But since we're doing all web work, this isn't much of an issue. If you were getting too much too many darks, you could pull back the output level so your blacks weren't as black, weren't becoming clogged up. and Or you could pull in your whites if you're if you weren't getting a, a good printed white, if the dots were disappearing because they were too darn small. That's why they have that. But it's amazing that they would have something as really nice and high-end as this, a very Photoshop type of a thing in a free online program. That's just incredible to me. Just again to illustrate the curves, it's as if each time I click on a spot, it's as if I added a new handle to that levels control. See what I'm saying? So I can have as many as I want. You can also select white point, black point, and midpoint using these little eyedroppers. That's something to go into and play with sometime. But, uh, but you'll get some amazing results just using that. So if you want to change the contrast, like I said, use the levels control and pull these end ones in towards each other to increase the contrast. Or my favorite way is to go to the curves control and without changing these top extreme ones, so I don't ever lose any blacks, move this one in so it's a little higher, and move this one in so it's a little lower, getting an S-curve, as we call it, where you're still going through the same center point, but I've increased the steepness of this curve, and that makes for higher contrast without destroying any pixels or blowing out any of the uh, extreme whites or the darkest blacks. Okay? Cool. So, heck, I'm going to leave that the way that is. Now, this isn't a, um, what they call, non-destructive uh, change. So, what I just did actually was done to the master. You can, however, do the equivalent of a non-destructive change. I'll just go ahead and get rid of the curves change. By making a copy of the layer, you drag the layer down to the little empty page icon down there and let go and it makes a copy. Now go ahead and do your changes. Do them to the copy. Okay. And uh, so now you've done it to the copy. You said when you save it, you save it as layers. Um, now if you've gone too far, you can change the opacity of that upper layer. You see the difference? So I can change the opacity to let more of the original show through if I went and overkilled. If I got a little bit too extreme on my contrast, I can pull it back and get a mellower effect. All right? So that's another great reason for always doing these types of adjustments on a copy is because I can overdo it and then pull back on the effect using the opacity slider as I mix these two together. Okay, so any questions? We're coming up on, uh, on two hours now. I don't mind hanging around, though, if you've got questions. Uh -huh. Oh, cool. Okay, I've just been asked for my Twitter ID. That's it's easy. It's uh, Terry Britton. <laughs> okay, T-E-R-R-Y-B-R-I-T-T-O-N. That's my Twitter ID. And uh, the website is terrybritton.com. So that's easy to get to. And in fact, I've got a uh, sign-up sheet on there for when I do future webinars. Uh, I didn't for this one, but because I already bugged my list twice in a row with the same webinar, so I figured uh, I wouldn't.
for this one. However, on um, at terrybritain.com, I have a sign-up sheet from uh, that's an Aweber mailing list thing, and you can sign up on there. It's loading incredibly slow. Um, and uh, sign up on there to take a look at uh, well to to get to get notifications. Uh, what I was going to say about the stock exchange thing is they also do have some different um, uh, permissions things. So always do kind of research and take a look. But uh, but we didn't go through this as much. Oh, there's one other source I forgot. Oh gosh, is the uh, office. Let's see. Uh, oh, where did I find that? Does anybody remember the uh, Office link for Microsoft Office? There it is. Here we go. Here we go. At Microsoft Office, they've got a um, images link. So let me uh, throw that in here. This is mostly clip art from like the 90s. <laughs> But they have some nice stuff, and you see that they do mask some of these things. They put them in white backgrounds. So, uh, and so, like I say, you, you don't have to download it. This is already 879 by 750. They tell you what the size is. Uh, the fact that it's up here means I can use it. I just do the old thing, copy image location, go to my photo editor, open image URL, and paste it in. And I wind up with a already uh, white background I, thing here that I can easily make a selection of. Uh, this one, I'm having to be a little more subtle because the tolerance... Oh, I've got the contiguous on. One second. Turn off contiguous because I only want the outside to be selected. It's still dipping into the lakes area and into here because I've got such a high tolerance. It's a good example of that. Let's turn down... My tolerance, I think it's turned down. Yeah, turn it down. See, it's only going into here. It's still a little bit high. So let me deselect again and go a little lower. Down to 10 or so. Yeah, okay. Now it didn't select into those grays, you see. It's left a little bit of pixels out here. Now I can uh, hold down, sh you can hold down shift and keep clicking around and try to get rid of the extra little dancing pixels when you have the tolerance set too high. you got to get right on them to get rid of them. But usually it's not so desperate. Or you can select the lasso tool and draw a circle around the little offending thing with the shift held down. If you hold the shift down, you'll notice that you've got... Let me see if I can zoom in on that. No, I can't. When you get the... Uh, shift held down you get minus or plus depending on what you what's happening with the um, with the selection so shift makes it a little plus um, hold the shift and the control down makes it a minus so it's actually removing content from the selection and so I'm adding to the selection when I do this little number like I did right here that adds to the selection and gets rid of that I can subtract from the selection by uh, holding down the control also, shift and control, and that would actually subtract content. Like, see, it would make a hole in there. That's a way of chopping, making donuts out of things. Okay? And undo, if you make a mistake, simply undo, and will undo your last selection. Okay. So, uh, this is a perfect candidate. We'll have to go ahead and do edit, invert selection. Because remember, what the mask is going to show is going to reveal what's actually selected. And then I simply go up here. Now I cannot hit, by the way, you notice it's in background mode with a little lock. I've got to unlock it by double clicking that and now I can make a layer mask. Now it's beautifully uh, transparent. I just go up here again to edit, I mean, uh, sorry, to layer and apply the layer mask and I wind up with my transparency so now I can Select all, copy, move to my next thing, and paste. And there it is with the transparency. Okay. Now, there are ways that uh, I'll probably do in a future little, a bunch of sh little short uh, 
tricks types of uh, videos. There's ways to make this selection a little bit tighter and tighten up on the mask. Uh, it just goes beyond the scope of this. There's a few different approaches I can take and um, and I'm just not sure which approach I should take uh, in this program. I know how I would do it in Photoshop, but I'm not sure how I would do it in this program. But there would be ways of making the, of softening the edge so my selection edge wasn't a hard selection. The anti-alias does some of that, but there's other things I could do, um, including using Gaussian blur and stuff like that on the mask. But, uh, but that's for another time. All right, so... Yes, I did. I did say I could use Gaussian Blur on a mask. Let's see. Make that a... Yeah, apply layer mask. Select all. There we go. So there's my add layer mask. You can actually... See, you can select either of these. The one that's red is the one that's being edited. So if I've got the little E there, then I'm editing the picture part. But if I click here and I have the little E there, you notice, notice it's kind of a green color United States uh, silhouette. That's the actual part that's making all the everything work. And you can actually make that kind of fuzzy. Or you can select it itself and uh, and further refine it. You can add Gaussian blur. You can do all kinds of things. Because it's actually image content that's making that uh, making the mask work. It's actually an image. So when I do this selection with the magic wand, I'm now selecting this mask and I can do things like increase the amount of the selection and stuff like that. I can blur it um, using the adjustment layer, the filters here, like this Gaussian blur. I can literally bl blur the mask and make it so it penetrates a little bit more into here. And uh, and it has an effect. It's not so visible right now, but once I apply this thing, it it might be more visible. But I, like I say, I'll do some more videos on that later on. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and apply layer mask. Select all, copy, paste, and there we go. Oops. Select. Okay, so I'm um, leaving it open. There you go. In fact, that is that worked. It made it a little bit smoother transition, not as hard a transition as the previous version was. And all I did was select the outside of the mask and blur it a little bit, and uh, so it penetrated into the white. Okay, so uh, any last questions? It looks like I've satisfied everybody's needs in spades. So, uh, everybody's feeling fulfilled? Okay, you're welcome, Phil. Alright, well, great. It's been a good session. I'm really glad uh, glad you all came. And, uh, and we certainly covered a heck of a lot. Um, I will be, uh, like I say, I'll have this all posted up on uh, YouTube, and we'll share, it with the, share the link with you all. Uh, and I've got one from last week to cover pretty much the same material. Uh, I'm still in the fence whether to uh, put that one up also. It might be just too much redundancy. Plus, besides, this is a two-hour webinar, you know. And, uh, but, but we really covered a lot of good stuff on this one, and uh, I think this will probably be the one that goes up on YouTube. So I'll be sending you that link. I'll, I'll work on that tonight and get it uploaded, okay? All right, well, thanks a lot for coming, and... Uh, and look for this on in your email and always get in touch with me again at uh, get uh, tbritain at gmail.com and I see oh look at that I've got an internal server error huh and uh, my site is apparently having some some dead zone issues uh, go to the, my website and sign up for the um, the newsletter, well, the mailing list. I don't really send out a newsletter per se, but when I do do webinars or anything really special has happened on the website, I'll notify people that something's happened through that thing. And, and if something really cool comes my way, I'll share it. Okay? Um, I haven't I haven't gone so far as to use it for marketing yet or anything like that, but even if I did, it would only be something I was totally crazy about. So, uh, so worry not. I'll never stuff people's mailboxes with junk. 
All right, so take care and uh, stay in touch, really. Let me know how this all was working for you and uh, send me emails and uh, uh, or, or make comments or at the YouTube page when you uh, go to watch it and things like that, okay? Have a good afternoon and, uh, and go practice now. Bye-bye. <laughs>